general overview of the 2019 election. The key dates to know for our uh, purposes are September 24th is National Voter Registration Day. October 7th is the last day to register to participate in the 2019 election. October 8th is when early voting begins, and November 5th is Election Day. Uh, on the ballot this year, you'll find local judges, uh, local school boards, city government, and county government positions, as well as local ballot issues. Who may help other folks register to vote? Really, anyone can help someone else register to vote, with the minor exception of those who have been convicted of a felony after May 2nd, 2006. Uh, this is obviously a very specific carve-out. Uh, it's the result of litigation and uh, directives and all sorts of, you know, sort of mechanics that exist in the voting world, but all you really need to know is that someone who has been convicted of a felony after 2006 cannot help others register to vote. I'll talk about it in a second. They themselves can vote, but they cannot help others register to vote. Um, however, minors and non-citizens can. So if you have communities such as high schools or refugee communities or other communities that are looking to engage in the voting process but cannot themselves cast a ballot, those folks can still get involved by helping others register to vote. And in fact, it's a pretty powerful uh, message to say, you know, I cannot cast the ballot on my behalf, which is all the more important that you should be um, voting, not on, just on behalf of yourself, but on behalf of me who cannot cast my own ballot. Uh, something to note about when you have to, as a helper, put your own name on a voter registration form. We get asked this a lot. If you're a helper out in the field registering someone to vote, you yourself have to put your own name on the registration form. So if the voter completes the registration form and signs it themselves and you did nothing other than hand them that form, you do not need to put your own name anywhere on that form. If you complete the whole registration form, but the voter is still capable of signing the form themselves, you also do not need to put your name anywhere on the form. The only time that you need to write your own name on the voter registration form is when the voter cannot even sign the form and the helper signs the form on behalf of the voter. If that were to occur, that is the only time that the helper has to print their own name underneath the signature. So you can see I did a little graphic here. Uh, you can see that where there's on the form they ask for the signature, you would either uh, you know, write the voter's name or just write an X and then print your own name underneath. That's because you are now serving as a witness that that voter in fact intends to register to vote. That's so you know, Joe Smith doesn't get a random voter registration that he never even looked at, right? And then you know, there's a registration form that has some signature that's not hit. Well, this way, if there were to be, if Joe Smith, you know, approaches the Board of Elections and says, I didn't register to vote, well, they know who to follow up with. So you can, you know, you are essentially serving as a witness that that voter does, in fact, intend to register to vote. A tool out in the field that we have is called ohvotes.org. It is, that's the domain name. Um, it's not Ohio Votes spelled out. That is a common mistake, so make sure it's ohvotes.org. Uh, and that's our voter portal. It's a simple interface, and I'll have screenshots on the next page, but it's a simple interface designed to easily and quickly load on smart devices uh, so that you can, out in the field, quickly quest, uh, check others' voter registration. It collects information so that we can send the voters updates or text voting reminders if they opt in. Uh, you'll see in a second the screen, it does ask for your email or phone number, but you do not need to put those to use the feature. But it also allows us to track voting patterns. So if someone checks uh, their regi voter registration status through us, we can actually then uh, subsequently discover whether folks were more likely to vote at all if they, for instance, confirm their registration through our website. Um, and it allows us to track voting patterns um, with the population that we are reaching through this site. Uh, it also cross-references with the voter files as well as the purge list. So this is a few screenshots of the website itself. Uh, the, the screen on the left, which says, check my voter registration. If you go to ohvotes.org, this is what it'll look like on your phone. This is literally a screenshot from my phone from a few weeks ago. Um, so it's obviously very large print, easy to read, clear to follow. So you can then uh, see, what, you know, see which function is the most at need for that voter. Um, if you click the check my voter registration, you will get to the second screen, which is says, am I registered to vote? 
as you can see, all they need to put in is their first name, last name, birth year, and then their county. They can also put their email address and phone number if they would like to receive voting reminders, but if they don't put either their email address or phone number, they can still look up their information uh, and we will not have any of their contact information. Um, so let's say someone named John Smith uses our, uses our uh, page to check their registration. Well, if you click John Smith, it should match you up with all of the John Smiths in that county. So as you can see on this, we actually have the date of birth uh, listed. Um, and this is actually something that will not be an issue this, this year now that we have uh, tweaked the website. So prior to it would just give you all of the John Smiths in the uh, county. It'll now give you only the John Smith with your birth year. So if you search John Smith 1928, you will only get John M. Smith on Willoughby Street. Uh, you can then click This Is Me, which will send you then back to the first page of the Check My Voter Registration, um, or you can click Wrong Address, and it'll prompt you to re-register. If there's no match, they can click the No Match button, uh, and they can either uh, register right through that portal, or what we suggest is actually having paper forms available. So if it's either the wrong address or there's no voter registration, we recommend um, actually handing them a paper form and letting them submit their registration that way. Uh, that's just because a lot of folks really prefer to, uh, to fill out a paper form over typing something on their smartphone. Um, and it also allows uh, folks who do not have a physical Ohio ID to still register. If you, use, if you register online, uh, you can do that through our website, but you need an Ohio ID to do that. So who can register to vote? Uh, a voter must be a U.S. citizen at least 18 years old by the date of the general election. So this won't be so relevant for 2019, but for your 2020 plans, uh, note that if someone is 18 years old by the general election 2020 date, uh, they can vote in the primary even if they're only 17 at that time. So for instance, the first time I cast my ballot, uh, I was 17 years old because I was turning uh, 18 over the summer and would be 18 by the general election date. They have to be an, a resident of Ohio for at least 30 days before the election. Often people will tell me, you know, we just moved here, can we register? Uh, and if they've lived here for 30 days, then yes, they can. Are not currently in jail or in prison for a felony conviction. Uh, note that if they're awaiting trial uh, or if they're on community control, they can still vote. Um, folks who are on community control will need to re-register. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and also, they must not have been declared incompetent for voting by a probate court. Um, I have consulted with the Disability Rights Ohio's uh, voter protection team, and they have uh, assured me that they don't know of any circumstances where that has become relevant. Um, note that if someone has a legal guardian, they can still vote. It is a specific designation that someone has been declared incompetent to vote, and it rarely, if ever, actually occurs. So I put this in because that is the rule, but um, just note that that will rarely, if ever, be relevant to the voters that you're interacting with. Re-registering to vote. Who needs to confirm their voter registration? Everybody. I will talk about the voter purge in a few slides, but long story short, even if people think their voter registration is completely up to date, it is worth running through ohvotes.org. It only takes a minute, and that voter can go to the polls with confidence that their voter registration is uh, indeed processed and up to date. Uh, other folks who need to re-register are people who have moved since their last registering. They've changed their name. They have not re-registered after getting out of prison or jail for a felony conviction, or they may have been purged. When you are registering, folks, there are a few common errors. On the next screen, I'll actually have a picture where I'll walk you through this. The most common mistakes that we see are incomplete registration forms, illegible registration forms, invalid or outdated registrations, whether that's they put a wrong address, they used a former name, or they were purged from the rolls. Um, but most frequently, it's believing that they are registered, but they are in fact not, whether that's because they believe that re requesting an absentee ballot in fact, registers them to vote, which it does not, or because they just thought they were registered, but you know that was 20 years ago and they haven't re-registered and they've been, been purged, whatever it might be. 
Um, the wrongly believing that the absentee ballot registers them to vote is actually a specific problem for the low income and underserved communities. Um, NOVA, which is the North, Northeast Ohio Voter uh, Advocate, they did a study in 2016 that determined that 15 to 21 percent of the low income voters in Cuyahoga County who had requested mail in ballots uh, were not properly registered. And that was significantly higher than other income brackets. For example, if uh, folks made over $100,000 a year, they were at a less than 1% uh, rejection rate, which means uh, obviously that this is a specific problem to the population that we are uh, working with. And it might be an education gap. It might just be an access to the ballots gap. You know, we're not sure where the disconnect is. But what we do recommend is prior to actually giving anyone an absentee ballot form, you first check their registration. And I'll, I'll repeat that point later on. So this is actually a picture of a voter registration form. Uh, and I've made a few uh, notes that just sort of indicate what the most common errors are. So uh, the circled are things that are often either left blank or done wrong. So are you a US citizen? Uh, and will you be at least 18 years of age or older? People often just skip this whole box, I think, for whatever reason that that format, formatting uh, makes it easy for the eyes to skip. And often they'll skip down to the last name, first name, uh, and they'll miss that little box. So uh, the second thing that will happen is people will invert the last name or the first name. They'll put the first name where the last name goes and vice versa. Another mistake that is common is people will put the country rather than the county, or they'll leave it blank because they don't know their county. Another mistake is they will put today's date as their birthday or their birthday as today's date. I have that little uh, green arrow so you can see that those are often inverted or one of them is left blank. Some folks will try to leave their driver's license number or social security number blank, either because they don't know it or because they don't feel comfortable sharing it. Unfortunately, this is the one that will absolutely not be processed if this error is made. If it's not signed, same thing. But if, you, if you're just missing uh, the county or a birth date, um, technically those forms could still be rejected on those grounds. Everything is technically required to be, be uh, correct to be processed. That being said, many boards of elections, if it's sort of, if it's logical that the that voter is otherwise eligible and it's one minor error. For instance, if you forget to check that you're a US citizen, uh, they'll probably still process it, but they technically have the right to reject it. So these are really important uh, scans to do prior uh, to the voter walking away. But the absolutely will never be processed, no matter what, is if someone leaves the driver's license number or last four digits of their social security number blank. So what address should you use when registering? First of all, you have the right to vote even if you are homeless or lack a permanent address. Voter registration forms, of course, require an address. So uh, state law defines that as uh, somewhere that you uh, intend to return to live. But the thing is that obviously homeless voters don't have that. So what they can do is they can uh, register at any place where they intend to return and can receive mail. So for instance, if they have a homeless shelter or other agency where they can receive mail, they can use that address. Uh, we recommend that they use an address close to where they actually physically sleep so that they are in the correct voting uh, district and precinct. That being said, uh, if you are an agency or organization that is working with homeless folks, what you can do is offer the address of your agency or your church or uh, whatever physical uh, location that you, your organization has to serve as a homeless person's uh, address for the sake of registering to vote. So you can say, you know, use our church address. Uh, we will hold on to the voter registration confirmation when it comes in the month uh, and, you know, come by and pick it up. If you're a college student or someone else who is more transient and has both a permanent address as well as a temporary address, uh, you may use either address to vote. Obviously, you just can't use both. So students or other folks who are not at their permanent address, they should not need additional proof of residence if they use their Ohio license or state ID, as you can see in big letters at the bottom. Uh, the address on your state ID does not need to match your voter registration address. 
That being said, poll workers are not always trained correctly on this rule. Uh, I, for instance, myself had an instance where my ID did not match and uh, they attempted to give me a provisional ballot. Obviously, I uh, pushed back on that and ultimately was given a regular ballot, but had I not known my rights and asserted those proactively, I would have gotten a provisional ballot despite having a sufficient ID. Uh, so we do recommend that someone, if they do have another proof of ID and they are using an, an address that is different than their state ID, to bring uh, some other proof of residence. This isn't something that they should need or legally required to have, but it could save them a headache at the polling location. Students that live in dorms may request an address verification form from their university, so they, because obviously they don't have a lease agreement, uh, they can use that instead. And students from outside uh, another state, they may register to vote in Ohio, but they just have to choose one. They cannot be registered in multiple states, so they can either stay registered in their home state and vote absentee if that's an option for their home state, or they can register to vote at their Ohio address. So if you have a felony conviction, you can vote as long as you are not currently incarcerated for that felony conviction. So the folks who can vote, who often believe they cannot, are folks who are uh, in jail or awaiting trial on a misdemeanor. If it is only a misdemeanor, they, they should have every right to vote as any other citizen. Of course, the problem then becomes access to the ballot. If they are currently being held in jail, it can be difficult for them to uh, get the information and the voting forms that they need to cast the ballot. That being said, the only folks who are literally uh, legally barred from doing so are folks who are currently incarcerated for a felony conviction. If they are awaiting trial, they can still vote. If they have been released but are on either parole, probation, or in a halfway house, any of those folks can still vote. The only thing to note is that when you are convicted of a felony, your name is removed from the voter roll which means in order to ensure that you can vote after being released, you will need to re-register to vote. So oftentimes folks with felony convictions will think that they can no longer vote because their registration uh, no longer exists after they're released. So, you know, just as they have so many other limitations after they're released, they just assume that voting is another thing they're not allowed to do. Uh, this is a common misconception. Uh, so be sure to correct folks out in the field when you have the opportunity uh, that they can still register to vote. What to know about the voter purge? I know that you all probably in the news hear headlines um, and aren't sure, you know, what is important for a voter to know, what isn't. So long story short, everyone should confirm their voter registration. Even people who may think that they are registered could still be improperly listed on the voter purge list. We have found that there have been errors on the voter purge list so that even folks who have recently, have voted as recently as May, have been found to be on that or at risk of being purged. They will not be purged prior to the 2019 general election day. If you find that you are on the at risk of being purged or someone you know close to you is improperly, uh, please contact your board of elections uh, also, reach out to the League of Women Voters Ohio's uh, Nazik Hapasha, who has been helping to organize our uh, efforts around the voter purge. Um, there has been a lot of noise from various volunteers and organizations that they'd like to reach out to folks who are on the at-risk of being purged list. Uh, I have gotten feedback from the League that they would advise against doing that, at least at the moment. Uh, there are a variety of different ways that you can get involved uh, and you can certainly reach out to Nozick if you have um, more questions, but they recommend one, um, reaching out to the people that they know on the purge list. So actually, if you get the uh, list of folks who are at risk of being purged, you can sort it by uh, zip code. So you can look at your own zip code, see if there are any friends and family on that list, and then contact that person directly. Uh, the problem with doing a blind outreach mechanism is frankly you're not sure who you are reaching. You might um, be reaching out to someone who did in fact move. You might be reaching out to someone whose uh, partner just passed away and therefore is on the at-risk of being encouraged list and you know maybe they're not going to be super thrilled about someone coming up to their door to remind them of that. Um, and so prior to doing just sort of the blind outreach that some folks have been very motivated to do, um, I recommend 
reaching out to the League of Women Voters to see how you can plug into their efforts and make sure that um, you're maximizing impact. Once someone does register to vote or uh, update the registration, they should receive a confirmation from their Board of Elections within 20 business days of receipt. So by the time you add in mail, probably about 24 days, you should receive a little a postcard from the Board of Elections saying that your registration went through and you are now registered to vote. That registration confirmation postcard cannot be used as proof of address when you go to vote. So if the only proof of address you have is your registration confirmation, you are going to be forced to vote provisionally. Essentially, you cannot register to vote somewhere and then use that registration as proof that you live there. So that is just something that people often will mistakenly think is a good ID, and it is not an accepted form of identification when going to cast your vote. So nonpartisan voter uh, messaging, just uh, oftentimes we find that people, uh, once they get used to talking in a nonpartisan way, it does become easier. Uh, but just as a starting point, how do you engage in voter dialogue that is uh, nonpartisan? Uh, and often it's keeping it simple. We're working to empower low-income communities. Uh, the organization or the people that our organization re represents and work with are underrepresented in the uh, democratic process, and we want to make sure that we build their representation. Um, if you're talking to voters, let the voter lead the conversation. This is really the most effective way to get them engaged meaningfully. Ask them what they can care about, what their concerns are, uh, what issues are most important to them, and go from there. Help them look up the candidates. Help them look up uh, the ballot issues and make sure that those folks are ready to um, vote their own conscience. You don't have to you know, provide that conscience. You can just uh, give them the guidance they need to put, translate their values into uh, casting their ballot. Uh, remind people to confirm their registration, even if they believe their registration is up to date. As I mentioned, the voter purge has been an imperfect process, to say the least, so even folks who uh, have done their due diligence might uh, need to check their registration. Uh, and that can actually be an interesting way to um, engage voters if you're tabling. We have heard successes from folks who have said something along the lines of, um, you tell voters that they might be purged even if they think they should be registered, even if they just voted, uh, they'll at least stop for a second and, and think about uh, whether they're registered and maybe even take the time to check it. Um, but do stay positive. My tagline is always voting is easy, fun, and important. Uh, the rationale, of course, being if you can make a voter believe that voting is all three of those things, easy, fun, and important, then you can get them to show up to the polls. It also helps guide the conversation when you, uh, you know, need to frame whatever message that you're making. Uh, so by, deep, by uh, consequence, voting is easy, fun, and important. Don't make vo voting sound hard, don't make it sound boring, and don't make it sound trivial. So that can help you keep on message even if it's avoiding saying the wrong thing. Uh, peer pressure does in fact work. So when people believe that voters, when turnout will be high, it is more likely to be high. Uh, so don't tell voters that vote, uh, turnout will be low. That being said, it is important and valuable to note that uh, local elections, such as this year's elections, uh, do make each vote count a little bit more. Instead of a voter pool of the entire nation, your voter pool is your jurisdiction. It is your county or your city or uh, your specific district. And that can be the difference between your vote being one, of a few, one out of a few million to one out of a few thousand or even hundreds. And so the value of each vote is proportionally more in these local elections. Um, and so that's a way to really focus not on the turnout at large, but the importance of being uh, even marginally invested in these local uh, off-year elections. Uh, point out that this is their opportunity to exercise their right to vote. Um, a lot of folks will also point out that if they are from a marginalized community, whether it's uh, women or African Americans or um, Native Americans, um, how hard those folks worked to get that right to vote. Um, oftentimes, you know, I don't think it works great to, you know, be a, a white person talking to a black, black person and telling them that it's their social obligation to vote. I don't think that would be ideal. But if you are speaking to a number, another member of the community that you're a part of and you want to remind them of the things that uh, your ancestors and um, 
you know, predecessors did to even get your community the access to the ballot, that can be a powerful incentive on pointing out the importance of, of voting. Uh, just a general also appeal to, this is their opportunity to exercise their right to vote. Uh, this is their opportunity to voice their concerns about their community. Political leaders pay attention to people and communities that vote. Uh, if you are looking for accountability from your elected officials, then you need to be part of the community that elected them. Um, or conversely, will work against them if they uh, do not act adequately represent your interests. You may explain what it means to register with a party, even if you cannot support or oppose a party. Uh, and you may provide nonpartisan voter guides. You just cannot suggest which candidates to vote for or which party to join. Uh, so this is how I describe sort of leading folks to the water. So you might not be able to say, you know, vote for candidate X because they have the best take on Medicare. What you can say is you can ask the voter what they're interested in and what priorities they have. You can then help them look up the candidates for office and match up what they just said with what the candidates are saying. So if that voter is prioritizing uh, climate change, you can help that voter look up the candidates' websites and see what they have to say about climate change. Now that's not you endorsing any party or candidate, but what it is helping you do is matchmake for that voter to say, you know, based on what you've told me, here's the candidate that has the most in line position, here are some of the other candidates' positions, uh, you know, here are some other issues that those candidates care about. Uh, and one thing I do like to point out to voters is if the issue in question is not mentioned, that's usually for two reasons. One, that candidate doesn't have any control over that issue. So for instance, a local candidate might not have a view on the federal Medicaid expansion because they have no control over whether that happens or not. Um, or if it is a issue that's within that candidate's control and they don't mention it, well, that probably tells you a little bit something about how high of a priority that issue is. So as far as encouraging other folks to vote is eliminating the barriers to voting. So there are individual barriers, but there's also systemic barriers to voting. Some of those systemic barriers include just generally oppressive rules um, so, for instance, the ID requirements are very difficult for some folks. Uh, a lack of resources for either the polling location, so maybe there aren't enough poll workers to make the line go quickly. Um, maybe it is a lack of communication regarding a polling location change. Um, if there's any voting in, in cha changes in voting procedures, you can anticipate that there will be more questions and confusion on election day. Um, often this happens when uh, polling locations shift or ID requirements change. And you'll also find that there are under or wrongly trained poll workers. Again, this is frequently not a reflection of any um, malintent. It's largely you know, due to either they misremember the rules or they're busy and they forget. You know, people, uh, poll workers are humans as everyone else. Um, so the more aware you are of your rights, uh, the uh, more you can actually assert those rights and ensure that people aren't wrongly getting turned away from the polls or uh, gratuitously filling out provisional ballots, for instance. There's also individual barriers to voting. It might be due to a physical disability. It might be to a lack of transportation, uh, a lack of availability, um, problems with registration, or no proper ID. Um, so what we really uh, recommend folks do is to focus on eliminating as many of these barriers to voting as possible. Because of course, you don't want anyone's reason for not voting to be that they couldn't. You can send us pictures and videos of your activities. We can use it on social media or share your social media. It can also give your organization some publicity about the community engagement that you're doing. You should, of course, get pats on the back that you deserve for doing this work. And it can also encourage other partners to continue programming, whether that's because you have a new and innovative idea or you just, you know, light the fire uh, um, under someone else's butt by uh, them seeing how successful and innovative your voting program is. We do have an initiative called Why Ohio Votes. It's essentially designed to be uh, a chain reaction for community leaders. So they submit a short video up to a minute long saying why they plan to vote in 2019 and tag or nominate and or nominate three people to do the same. Of course, the goal of this is to create positive momentum around the elections. And so by creating the Ohio, Why Ohio Votes initiative, what we're really trying to do is change the narrative to make it, instead of being about supporting a candidate, 
It is about you empowering yourself and your community to vote uh, in a positive way. If you do get press inquiries, of course, remember to stay nonpartisan if you are a 501c3. And if you get press inquiries specifically about Ohio votes, you can re redirect them to our Communications and Development Director, and his contact information is listed right there. Also, social media is always a great way to get the community engaged, uh, to share information about deadlines, to empower the community, to do a fun fact about voting or about the election. If you choose to use social media, you can, of course, tag us. We have a Facebook page, Ohio Votes, and then for Twitter, we actually just use our organization, Ohio's Twitter. Election protection, there is a nonpartisan voter hotline. It's available 24-7. On non-election day, it might, you might get a call, a return call back, but on election day, it is staffed all day. There are, I have included the English, Spanish, and Chinese phone numbers. There are some other languages available. Uh, just for brevity's sake, I put um, only these three, but if you need a specific language, uh, it likely exists, and um, so you can find that specific language number to have uh, for your population. If people are looking to research their ballot, they can first look at vote411.org. That's the League of Women Voters website, which generates voter-specific voter guides. That means you can plug in your registration address, and they'll pull up what ballot you're going to have when you show up to the polls. If you would like physical copies of the local voter guides, you'll need to reach out to your local League of Women Voters chapter to receive those. Also remember, Google is your friend. Things that are make for great resources for voters are local write-ups of elections, ballot issues, and candidates. So, for instance, here in Columbus, the dispatch always does a few numbers on uh, each of the ballot issues as well as the candidates. Uh, and so you can share direct the voter towards those resources. Uh, you can also look at the campaign websites for the candidates and parties. Uh, again, you can often derive a lot of information about those candidates' values uh, just by uh, looking at what their focus is on the website. And then find the interest groups that you trust and support and look at what they're putting out regarding the election. So they might support or oppose a ballot issue. They might have specific commentary on a candidate's position or otherwise help inform that voter on what candidates and parties best reflect their values. We will also be providing free rides to the polls and we are working with disability advocates to pursue handicap accessible transportation where possible. These are the Rise to the Polls phone numbers. Toledo is lucky enough to have its own acronym as they have Jobs with Justice is the organization that has been providing rides for uh, several years. Our phone numbers with local area codes so at least folks will feel like they are, and they will be calling someone local to request the ride. Ohio-based voting resources. So if you have questions about different topics, I uh, would recommend sending you to different people. So, if you have a question about disability voting, you can contact Kevin Truitt from Disability Rights Ohio. Questions about felony or in jail voting, you can contact China Baldwin from All Voting is Local. Questions about the voter purge, contact Nazik Kabasha at uh, the League of Women Voters of Ohio. To request or get questions answered about the Fair Court Speakers Bureau, I recommend reaching out to Camille Wimbish of Ohio Voice. Uh, and then general voting rights programming, I would recommend reaching out to Rachel Coyle of the ACLU of Ohio. They have a variety of different voting resources and material. We also have regional leaders whose contact information is uh, listed here. If you do have specific questions or are looking for specific connections in your area, uh, these are the folks that are uh, step one to, to contact. So I will be the statewide contact. So if you are not in any of these areas, you can always reach out to me. 